So today's session is meant to introduce and provide an update on the work currently underway by the International Council on Archives Expert Group on Archival Description. Well, let me go ahead then and um, introduce our presenters. So first off, we'll be hearing from Daniel Pitti, um, the chair of the expert group on Archival Description. Um, uh, he'll be introducing the, um, the content model that they're developing. And after Daniel, we'll be hearing from Florence Clavon, uh, one of the executive members of that group uh, for another update on the ontology work. So I'll go ahead and um, again, we'd like to thank them for participating in this. Um, and we'll look forward to their portion of this presentation. So Daniel. Thank you, Kerry. Okay. You can hear me fine? Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope everyone's having a good day in their respective time zones. Uh, next slide. So just a, a quick overview of records and context. Um, it is a four-part draft standard uh, of the four parts. There's uh, an introduction, which will be uh, released soon in version 0 0.2. There's the RIC conceptual model, which was released in July 0 0.2. The RIC ontology, which was released in February of, of this year. And finally, we're beginning to focus on application guidelines with no uh, projected date of completion on that at this point. Um, and as pointed out, the the people, the, the group behind this is the uh, ICA expert group in archival description, which currently has 21 members from 14 countries. Next slide, please. Um, today, I will provide a quick tour of the second draft of RIC CM, as the conceptual model is known, um, as an entity relation model. We'll cover the entities or an overview of the entities, the attributes of the entities and, and relations. And along the way, we'll point out the significant changes from the first draft. Next slide, please. Uh, in revising from version 0 0.1 to 0 0.2, we had extensive feedback to the 2016 draft, and that served as a basis for ongoing discussions and, and revision into version 0 0.2. Uh, the introduction was, was uh, thoroughly uh, revised to highlight um, the revised approach that Rick is taking to your archival description. The model was also made clear for those with ISAD G as a as a starting point, and that I said G is is uh, one of the four standards that uh, Rick is subsuming and replacing. Uh, the entity section was significantly revised to emphasize key key entities, and attributes and relation sections were were, were made clearer and to eliminate redundancy. And a major change was that we made a clear distinction between the, the intellectual content of a message and uh, instantiations or, or uh, um, the, the physical uh, inscription of the intellectual content. Next slide, please. Entities are now grouped in a four level hierarchy. Um, the root entity is thing and kind of saying all possible things. Uh, the in, in, entities and sub-entities in the model set out from levels two to four over to the right of the thing uh, are, are the key entities for archival description. And then the core entities, the one that deserve the most uh, focus are in bold. And uh, the other entities necessary for fully describing the core entities. 
addition of the thing entity allows uh, Rick CM to be extensible as other contextual entities necessary to fully describe records may be added in implementation. Next slide, please. A core entity, the record resource entity, is uh, in in the first version, the draft version we, we released. Um, we moved from ISAD's G's unit of descriptions and differentiated that into three different kinds of record entity, uh, with uh, record component becoming record part in this version. To emphasize that there are nonetheless similar kinds of things, uh, we've introduced record resource, which is to say a record set, a record, and a record part are kinds of record resource. Next slide, please. Record more or less, uh, well, more equates to ISAG's item level of description. It always documents there's evidence of an activity undertaken by an agent. A record must be inscribed at least once in order to become real and a record. Record part is discrete information content within which a record may uh, without which a record may not be complete. It's not always necessary to describe record parts. In fact, it, it, it tends to be somewhat on, on the rare side, but may well be for born digital records. Whether a record resource describes a record or a record part is a matter of perspective. Next slide, please. The record set is the key thing that Rick is introducing, is records grouped together by an agent based on shared attributes and relations, provenance, topic, date, place, et cetera, uh, to serve their own ends, which is to say the ends of the agent. As a conceptual aggregation, may be physically inscribed, but it's not necessarily so. So a record set is, is an intellectual construct construct. <clears throat> Excuse me. The record set may hold other record sets in a hierarchy, so caters for traditional multi-level provenance-based description at phones or series level and other types of collections. Also allows records to be grouped in other ways by creators, managers, archivists, and users simultaneously, simultaneously and over Time. So the key thing is, is, is that as an intellectual construct, um, any given record might appear in more than one set or any record set may appear in more than one set. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the, the, the key entity introduced that distinguishes uh, from the intellectual content of a record. Um, and this would be the, the physical inscription of the record, uh, either in a traditional media, medium or uh, digitally. And it makes a clear distinction between the physical and intellectual characteristics of a record. It allows the description of the carrier, carrier analog or digital on which the message is represented. A record must have one, but may have many instantiations. And instantiation may be derived from another instantiation, whether it is considered of the same or of a new record is a matter of perspective. So if the instantiation in, in any way um, changes what is considered a significant part of the message, then it would be uh, um, a new record if it's of a new record, if, if it's considered not to introduce such significant changes, then it's another instantiation of the same record. Next slide, please. Agent is, is another of the core 
entities at the second level, and it is uh, has sub entities of person and group, and group in turn has sub entities corporate body and family. The view is, is that additional kinds of groups may be defined in the future, but for now we'll stick with corporate body and family. Position is a new, new um, type of agent that's introduced and probably the best way to think of it is, is the intersection of a person and a corporate body or a family. And then finally, uh, another new agent is mechanism a process or system created by a person or group that performs an, an activity. Next slide, please. Anything that happens, an event is anything that happens in time and space. And it could be uh, some discrete uh, happening in, in a brief moment in time, or, or it could be a, of a long duration. It may be natural. Uh, such as a, an earthquake, say, or involve human uh, agents. It can be agent caused exclusively or a combination of natural and, and, and human. May have many sub events. Uh, a war has battles which have skirmishes and so on. Activity is a specific kind of event and it uh, very closely. Uh, aligns with the, the word function in ISDF. Um, I won't get into why we changed the terminology, but, but there was a, a humanizing reason for doing that. It is a kind of event that is carried out by an agent with an intended purpose. And, and all of that is key. The intended purpose is the key to activity. <coughs> Next slide. Please. Uh, additional entity is rule conditions that govern the activities of agents. They affect and may also specify the characteristics of things produced by activity, such as records, and how they are managed over time. R rule is, is particularly Im important. Mandate is a kind of rule. It is a delegation by an agent to another agent of the authority to, to perform an activity. And this is particularly important in, in, in government and in business and, and, and corporate contexts. It may be implicit or explicit as set out in laws, regulations, and standards. And important to point out that uh, as these, uh, as entities, you should confuse these uh, with the records that give them expression. So the description of a mandate or a rule would be based on, on, on uh, some so summary description of what would be found in such records. Next slide, please. And then uh, finally, we deal with days, date and place entities. And um, anyone familiar with EAD would recognize the three sub entities of date, single date, date range, and, and date set for uh, sets of non contiguous dates. And then the, the place entity. Next slide, please. Now, moving on from the entities to the attributes. Um, the characteristics of each of the entities which with relations constitute their their nature that gives the, the a specific entity it, its identity it is set out in two sections first there is an alphabetical list um, presented in uh, based on a template which you can see off to the right and um, giving things such as domain and specifications, whether it can be extensible or not. Uh, the list of attributes by entity there are, um, is the second way that we present it. And, and that is, is for each entity, it shows which attributes can be used with it. Um, 
it's done to list them in common. So it is a hierarchical distribution of the entities down to sub entities and so on. The entity hierarchy means that the attributes of each superior entity are shared by its sub entities. Okay, next slide, please. So at the very top, then it's thing, which has three attributes that can be used with anything a descriptive note, an identifier, and a name. Next slide, please. A record resource. So at the top, it inherits the, the, the three from thing, descriptive note, identifier, and name, but then it has four additional attributes that are distinct to it. Next slide. And then moving on to record and record part, Again, you can see the inheritance, you know, in, in the, the brownish color area and the blue area, and then uh, several additional attributes that are specific to record and record part. Next slide, please. And the, again, same thing taking place with record set. And I won't go into the details, but uh, those with an asterisk on them are, are the way in which the attributes are treated is is uh, described in full in the standard draft standard. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh, you you did. I'm sorry. I must have blinked when you did it. Um, and finally, attributes of instantiation. Again, you can see that they inherit from thing and, and then a list of, of distinct attributes that go with instantiation. It's probably worth quickly noting that um, in terms of describing physical representations of information, we didn't attempt to be exhaustive because we think that there are other standards that go into a great deal of of, of depth in that this would be uh, extended. For example, premise would be a good example. Next slide, please. Um, agents and sub agents, so they all share these attributes that is in the left table. And then each of them has uh, one or more distinctive attributes that go with it. Next slide, please. So event, again, you can see the inheritance from thing plus certainty, event type and history. Um, below it activity, which has the same as uh, attributes as event, but the addition of activity type. Uh, and off to the right rule and, and mandate, which share the same group of attributes. Uh, date and place entities, the date entity in particular has some uh, highly specialized um, attributes that go with it. We're getting down here with certainty. And in place, again, has specialized attributes that go with place. Next slide, please. Um, relations in RIC-CM uh, describe the connections between the, the, the entities. There are 78 of them, all of which have an inverse relation. Some are symmetric, such as it's associated with. It's not exhaustive, and it focuses on those reflecting the creation, transmission, management, and use of record resources. It's category, categorized into 13 groups, ranging from broader to narrow in a poly hierarchy, which is to say that any given relation might, might appear in, with one or more higher level relation. And so the 
they also have attributes that are associated in order to uh, augment and and describe relations. Next slide, please. Um, here are the the categories. So um, some of them are should should be rather obvious. Whole part sequential relations, subject relations. Resource to resource, re resource record to resource record relations, resource record to instantiation relations, provenance relations, instantiation to instantiation. So say so this instantiation is derived from that instantiation, that kind of thing. Uh, managerial relations, agent to agent relations, event relations, rule relations, date relations, and spatial relations. Next slide, please. Um, these the the hierarchy is is presented in uh, six levels, and you can you can see this set out in uh, the the uh, graphic to the right, the figure to the right. Um, so as you move to it, so thing is related to thing is the most general kind of relation. And so in, any entity could be related basically at the, at the most general level. But then as you proceed to the right, you have a sequential relation, thing proceeds or follows another. And as you go down, it becomes more specific as you move off to the right. And then the attributes that can be used for uh, qualifying relations is the relation can have an identifier, it can have a date, it can have certainty, uh, source of the evidence on which the relation is founded and a description. Next slide, please. Thank you. At, at this point, I, I'm sorry for rushing through that so quickly, but I wanna give us time to have a discussion at the end. I now, turn it over to Florence Clavo, who will uh, describe Rico. Thanks, Daniel. Can you hear me, everybody? Yes. yes? Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, so, uh, yes, I'm Florence Clavo. I work at the Archive National of France. I'm French, so my English will not be as uh, clear as uh, Daniel's, of course. <laughs> and um, I'm a member of GAD and also the um, I, I lead the, the record development team. As concerns uh, records in context ontology uh, or RICO, I will only provide key information, uh, then um, focus on some main characteristics of the ontology, um, particularly what relates it to the model, the conceptual model. And then if I, I have um, a few minutes left, I will uh, show some examples. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, RIC ontology, RICO, uh, is uh, the third part of RIC. Uh, as Daniel said, um, we uh, released the conceptual model um, to second draft in July, and uh, RICO second draft was published a, a bit uh, uh, earlier in February uh, 2021. Next slide, please. Uh, what is RICO? Uh, basically, it's a technical transposition of RICCM, uh, just like EAC CPF being a transposition of ISAR CPF. We can consider it as a transposition of ISAR CPF. Here we have a, a uh, RW, the OWL um, technical transposition of RICCM, uh, which is um, um, mainly uh, developed for uh, enable, enabling uh, archivists or records managers or engineers to publish high quality RDF graphs uh, in the semantic web, uh, graphs describing archives. Uh, in, in this sense, it's the first archival domain-specific comprehensive ontology. It's a rich one and consistent one already. And uh, it, um, uh, it was missing in the, in the landscape of um, 
cultural heritage ontologies. Um, today, and in fact, from uh, December 2019, uh, RICO is available uh, using its URI, uh, which is um, uh, typed in the, on the middle of the, the slide, uh, which means that if you are human and uh, just have a browser and you uh, use this uh, URI, you will reach a view, uh, an HTML view of the, the ontology, which displays its internal documentation, its, the specification. Uh, and um, as shown uh, on the right of the slides, you, you will, uh, will have uh, first the metadata of the ontology, and then uh, every component, uh, the specification of every component of the ontology. If you um, are a machine and want to uh, access the, the file, you, you uh, and, and just ask it uh, uh, its RDF version, you will reach an RDF file, uh, we, which you can also, of course, download from the HTML page and find in the GitHub repo of, uh, of, uh, of RICO. This GitHub repo is available publicly uh, online, uh, has been available since March 2020. Uh, and uh, this makes uh, RECO a public Git project. Uh, this means it can, that you can clone the repo, of course, and um, uh, of course to create issues or comments to uh, issues already existing. Um, let me also add that the repo includes uh, much more than the ontology file. It also includes uh, diagrams and examples and everything there uh, from the ontology to the, um, the examples and diagrams is um, published under CC BY 4.0 license. So you can use it uh, broadly. Uh, next slide, please. Um, RICO also comes with a small information website uh, where you can find uh, other information, uh, including uh, a page uh, explaining why use RICO, uh, also a page on the roadmap, and a page on projects and tools using or, um, projects using RICO or tools built um, about RICO. Uh, you can also use a discussion list to contact uh, IGAD and RICO developers. And uh, next slide. Um, now I will present some main characteristics of uh, RICO. First, uh, the first uh, thing we can we can say is that it's um, it's been developed it's been developed uh, for uh, many years now. Uh, there were uh, first early stage versions already usable, then beta versions that were shared uh, to um, people uh, after a call for volunteers and uh, from which we, we got comments, first comments. Then a 0 0.1 version in December 2019, then the, the current version. Uh, what I want to say here is, in fact, um, RICCM and RICO were developed side by side, and RICO uh, plays and played a major role in testing the conceptual content and logic of the model. RICO, uh, above among its main characteristics, is fully compliant with RICCM. I will uh, develop this. Um, this uh, feature. Uh, basically, uh, we can say, and summarizing, that all the entities, attributes, and relations that are defined in RICCM are also available in RICO. But there is much more in RICO, which is normal because it's a technical representation of the model. So you need, uh, um, as soon as you uh, go to technical um, representation, to go into greater detail. And uh, another reason uh, why it's, it's richer is that uh, we try to build um, an immediately usable and flexible ontology. It's also fully documented in, in English for now. Uh, we uh, hope that we can uh, translate the documentation into in Spanish and French uh, next year. Uh, Spanish and French being the, three, the two other languages that are official languages in uh, International Council on Archives. 
So now it's documented in English and uh, comes with an introduction uh, that explains uh, the design principles, gives uh, details about moving from CM to RICO, and also uh, lists the changes made to the, the pile since 2019. Each component is then defined both formally and using uh, annotation, which is metadata, definitions, scope notes, et cetera. And you also have uh, in the file um, a property that is used to specify for each component when applyable um, what, is, what the, the corresponding component is in CM. Next slide. Um, Back to the, this uh, being immediately usable and flexible feature. Uh, the, what we wanted is uh, providing um, a technical representation that would be used immediately to accommodate existing descriptive data. And also, of course, um, um, optimally represent that represented uh, archival metadata based on CM. Um, for example, now uh, in a lot of um, archival institutions, uh, not every agent is uh, described uh, within an authority control system with persistent identifiers. We uh, sometimes just have name strings uh, for the names of, this, of the agents. Uh, we also have uh, not, not often have controlled vocabularies. Uh, we, we may have um, more, uh, less rich metadata. And we also have uh, archival description being by essence flexibles, which means that depending on the means of the, on the knowledge you have, on the records you are describing, you will uh, be, um, we, we will, you will uh, type uh, very uh, short, um, uh, vague description or be much more accurate. And RICO has to uh, take this into account too, which means that, that as a consequence in RICO, you may often more uh, find one method and more for representing a fact or a statement. Next slide. Uh, try to illustrate this. But first, I want to say that uh, basically, and it's very easy to understand, RICCM entities, the 22 entities uh, that Daniel presented a few minutes ago, are available in RICO. All of them are available as classes, which is not um, surprising uh, if you know what an ontology is. Uh, a class is a category of uh, uh, objects, uh, just as in the model, an entity uh, is. Uh, category of uh, object in the world of archives. So uh, all the entities of RICCM become classes and have thus the same name, the same textual definitions, and the same position in the hierarchy of classes, an ontology based being also an object-oriented model. So here you have uh, on the left the um, formal um, specification, uh, I mean readable, human readable specification of the record class, which is just the same as the one that, um, that is in, uh, in RICCM for the record entity. And here on the right, you can see the hierarchy of classes in, uh, in um, RICO. I mean, uh, the top level of the hierarchy, which is uh, far um, more uh, accurate. You, you have, I mean, you have subclass, much more subclasses, but you can see that you have date, date range, date set, single date, uh, which represents um, the date entities in RICCM, just the same as they are defined. They are date range being a, a kind of date, a family, a kind of group, group, a kind of agent. This is the same in RICO. Um, next slide, please. It's a bit different for attributes. It depends basically uh, on uh, the, the value, the, sh the value schema of the attributes in CM. When the value schema in, in CM uh, is um, uh, text of uh, not a control value, uh, in the, the ontology, you have a verb to represent the attribute. And this verb has range, a literal, I mean, a string. 
uh, it's a simple uh, logical representation of these kind of attributes. This is the case, for example, for history, an attribute of CM. It's uh, here, you can see it's a RIC A21 history attribute, which corresponds to RICO history verb. And with, with here, it has range literal. When an attribute has a control value in RIC CM, it becomes a class in RICO which uh, enables um, archivists and engineer, engineers to use control vocabularies. I mean, for example, scores vocabularies uh, and uh, populate this class. Here you have the documentary form type class in RICO, which corresponds to the documentary form type attribute in RICCM. Uh, and uh, if you go to RICCM specification, you can see that documentary form type attribute has control value. Uh, you use uh, vocabulary uh, usually to, um, um, to fill this attribute. Uh, so this is a main rule. Uh, next slide for attributes. Now about the relations in RICCM, they become verbs, predicates in RICO, of course. Uh, and this time, uh, uh, it's different from data type properties uh, about attributes in CM. It's a verb that have uh, as domain and range, exactly the same domain and range as in RIC CM. Here you have the has pronouns um, object property in RIC O, uh, which corresponds to the has pronouns relation in RIC CM and uh, has domain, the, the instantiation or record resource has range agent, just like its corresponding relation in the CM. Here you have the hierarchy of, uh, of object properties. And uh, you can say, can see that, um, well, uh, you, you, will, uh, you will be able to check that uh, this uh, hierarchy is just the same as for the hierarchy of CM relations. Uh, the, the difference, next slide, slide please, being that uh, you have many more components in RICO than in RICCM, and you also have another important feature in RICO, it's that CM relations, many of them uh, at least, are also represented by classes in RICO, which enables uh, in, an, in the RDF world to assign uh, properties uh, just uh, AG dates, description, certainty, source, or any other data type property to the relation class. It also enables to extend the, uh, the model and uh, connect more than two entities uh, using this node. Uh, if you have just an object property in RICO, a simple object property, you will be able to, able to connect two entities. If you have a class, you will be able to connect more than two entities. For example, there you have a, a relation here, it's a class, a leadership relation, an example of a leadership relation. It connects a person, the corporate body that the person uh, uh, led, and the position that the person occupied uh, when he led this corporate body. So this relation allows to connect three uh, entities, in fact. It has it owns, it, its own description with beginning date, end date, certainty, etc. And in fact, it's uh, simply the representation, the, the semantic representation, the linked data representation of an EAC CPF, uh, CPF relation element. And uh, uh, in fact, it's, it's, uh, it's generated from an EAC CPF XML file. And you, uh, you can also find in RICO the fact that this uh, complex path is, has a shortcut here. This simple binary relation is defined as being the shortcut of this one. So it, it, is, uh, it allows a reasoner, uh, RDF reasoner to uh, infer this relation from this one, which is quite important. Um, next slide, please. I try to keep um, not to, to be too too long. This is a, a view of the hierarchy of the relation classes in RICO. Next slide. 
In practice, uh, though it remains a draft, um, considering its uh, long history and uh, the time we, we spent developing this ontology, we can consider it as a rich, consistent, and ready to use one. And in fact, it is already used in various projects uh, of which we have, um, uh, we have um, uh, put a list in the RICO website. Um, this is a list of uh, some of the projects. Uh, if Daniel wants to say a word about snack, I will let him uh, do it after the, the presentation. Uh, you also have some projects in Europe, and uh, I will simply just focus and um, say that the, the future version of the French archives portal, France Archive, uh, in uh, about one year will be a fully RICO, um, fully complete, we will use RICO uh, fully. Um, I don't have time for being longer. Uh, next slide. I just want to, to show uh, uh, some of other um, details, say other details. Uh, well, uh, the, the, what is important here is that um, um, we hope that more and more projects will use RICO and then that the feedback and analysis of the practice will make it possible to identify the most frequently used components and methods available in RICO or needs that are not addressed well, and then to be able maybe to make some components obsolete or to add other components. Uh, as we are going to uh, map record to other ontologies, uh, e.g. premise, we also may um, um, do modifications in RICO. Uh, anyway, uh, we hope that uh, we also be able to formulate recommendations and identify uh, use cases. Uh, uh, use case categories of use cases and document them. This is should be a collective work. I mean, um, um, also involve uh, RICO users and RIC uh, users uh, more broadly. Uh, next slide. Um, I'm not sure I can um, uh, go through all the examples I had prepared. Maybe I will show one or two. Don't know if I can, in fact. Next slide. Uh, well, all these examples are available, uh, main, uh, the, the vast majority of them are available in the uh, GitHub repo. Uh, this is an example that shows the uh, aggregation of record sets, the main uh, one of the key relation uh, between, uh, uh, in, between archives, uh, record resources. Uh, what we will present in uh, EAD finding ed using the XML tree with includes or included relation here. Um, and the uh, next slide. This is a graph, an RDF graph represented a French company that in fact produced the series of photographs shown just before. Uh, I will not have time for commenting this. Next slide. Um, this is one of the records, uh, which is part of the series um, uh, presented um, uh, a few seconds ago. This record is here. It's a current print, in fact. It's materialized uh, using the primary instantiation, which is the analog one, this one. And this instantiation was uh, digitized which resulted in another instantiation. And from this instantiation was derived a third instantiation. So you have a record with three instantiation, each one having its technical physical characteristics. This instantiation, we can consider it, uh, it is linked also to this one using um, an event, which is a digitization program. And um, this is an event in RIC and RICO. And, um, I mean, I, I will not be longer. Next slide. Uh, well, this is a, a rich representation of a place, a uh, geo-historical entity using RECO. Uh, this is a place, its physical location, the coordinates, two um, blocks of coordinates represented the same physical location. These are other places connected to the, to the place. And this is a place type. Uh, next slide. 
uh, well, I will um, go through this. Next slide. I just want, as a conclusion, next slide, please, to say that we have a roadmap. And in the roadmap, uh, we, um, uh, we, uh, we, we will uh, include mappings with other ontologies. Um, among which the, the first one sh maybe would be premise. Uh, there are other ones, of course, that um, we, we have to take into account, uh, uh, including CRM and uh, LRM, uh, and also RDA registry. Um, the roadmap is um, uh, presented in the, on the RICO website. Next slide, I think last slide is about um, uh, just a call for do not hesitate to contact us. And also another uh, a reference, a bibliographic reference to uh, other information about RICO. Um, I think I've finished. Uh, thank you for attention, your attention. Oh, wow, it might be too long. Thank you so much, Florence and Daniel. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Karen for just a minute, though, before we move into the Q and A. Yes, so thank you. I was not able to unmute myself. We are working with technical stuff here. Uh, many, many thanks, uh, Daniel and Florence, for this. And we do have a Q and A uh, planned uh, right now. So if you could enter your questions into the chat. Uh, so we have a couple of minutes for Daniel and Florence to respond. It's quiet. Uh, a question from me. You do have uh, the, con uh, no, we've got a long question here. Uh, what about EAD and about the new version of EAD to be fully compliant with all new concepts of RICCM? I know you can convert EAD to RICO, but you can't exploit all RIC potential REC towards instantization, instant instantization towards instantization. My spelling there and pronunciation isn't the best. I saw that we have Kirsten in the call. Would it be possible to let her? Well, uh, maybe it's I not can really ask... a uh, RIC question. Maybe I can answer the second question. Uh... First, yep, please, please do so. Yeah, um, uh, EAD uh, can be used for um, um, distinguishing, uh, I mean, um, generating a um, description of a record resource and a description of instantiation. You, you can uh, rely on, for example, di digital archival object elements and say this is uh, an instantiation. We can also say that from the physical description of the uh, record resource, you can uh, generate uh, the description of an instantiation. We did this and we do this uh, for all of our metadata in the National Archive of France. So I don't mean that an EAD uh, 2002 or EAD3 file is the best we can we could do for having a uh, very high quality uh, RDF recall files, but you can do it in fact, and uh, it works. And um, uh, what I mean is, uh, of course, uh, uh, in the world roadmap on EAD, um, you, you plan TSEAS plans to um, uh, consider uh, CM and recall and uh, uh, integrate uh, more details and be, uh, allow, uh, enable people to be more accurate, but you can just use EAD as it is to produce and the Africa quite rich data, I can guarantee it, it works. Um, may, may, may I just briefly, um, the, the, the first question is, you know, what, what about EAD and of course EAC CPF? So in, in, in many respects, the EAD is, is more ISAG by itself. And, uh, and then there's the EAC CPF, which is I, ISAR. And I haven't really given this a, a whole lot of thought, 
but if e EADs to be revised to say work uh, optimally w with Rick, my view is, is that, that ultimately it would be exclusively used as a communication standard for it and that it, it probably would be optimal to have something like an encoded archival description package that would include um, be able to, 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 to ship out an interrelated constellation of entities and their attributes and their relations. But it's, that's just a thought. It will be up to TSEAS to decide what they want to do. Exactly, and we have we have um, Karsten is in the call, but I'm not sure uh, if she wants to add something there. Uh, uh, another question, and I would say this one is uh, mostly for you, Florence. Again, how does Rick uh, Rick CM and Rick O relate to Max? Um, there is no um, obvious relation to Max. Max being uh, uh, a schema that allows to describe groups of um, resources. Of course, you can uh, you can from a Max file you you can imagine to uh, generate um, record sets uh, in, that include um, uh, records or or other record sets. And you have also a logical uh, section in Max, and you can um, maybe you can uh, draw something with from this, but. Yeah. Uh, Metz is not by itself a descriptive. Uh, um, it, it, it is about some metadata, but it's not, uh, it doesn't fully describe archives. So uh, our main concern will not be, uh, at least uh, I think uh, uh, now, to um, work on a mapping between Metz and, um, and Rick. Uh, I, I just to just add. Some, yeah, if I can just add just one comment on this, probably the member of EGAD to direct that question would be Tobias Vildi in, in Switzerland, who, who was one of the principal developers of a METS profile, which I think they called the profile Matter, Matterhorn, had to do yeah. with digital preservation. And, and he's in the process of completely reconfiguring that using R Rick and premise. And I think uh, a, a one or two other specialized ontologies, but he, he'd probably be the best person to, to respond well, to that question. Uh, what I was just saying is that Metz cannot be the only uh, starting point for describing METS by itself. I mean, of course, you can, yeah. Uh, yeah. You can wrap archival metadata in METS file, but it's, it's not a, fully, a full archival description. So we can use, uh, you, you should maybe, uh, most often you use METS with other descriptive metadata with premise, etc. cetera. Uh, I would not say METS uh, alone, consider METS alone and RICCM it's kind of, um, there, there are a lot of gaps. I mean, if you just consider MITS. Um. Thank you, Florence. And I see that you have already responded to, well, to the question regarding mappings built into the ontologies. Yeah. So, uh, and I think we are up to the final question. How do the mechanism and entity relate to the question on the responsibility of AI? Oh, mechanism can be considered as a, a way of representing an AI in the world of archives, of course. You can imagine to describe an AI as a mechanism, which uh, is um, um, responsible for uh, some activity, uh, which has some date, uh, which results in something, for example, adding, uh, modific modific modifying a description typically, or uh, creating instantiation or records, for example, high um, uh, handwritten uh, text recognition of a manuscript, 
etc. So yes, um, there is a, there is a, a close uh, a mechanism is a, is a way of you representing AI, AI is this in this universe. Yes, I would say yes, definitely. Thank you. Uh, Karsten, who is leading the sub team in TSAS for EAD, has written a long response. So we have, this, have it there. So with that, I just want to add or and say again, uh, wrapping this Q&A up, many, many thanks for uh, to you who have participated and to Florence and Daniel to doing this presentation. And I know I'm in Sweden, it's Lucia today. So you're supposed to be in a white gown, having lights, burning lights in your hair to celebrate that we are soon leaving the dark time of the year. Let there be light. Let there be light. Uh, many, many thanks. And the recording will be posted online. Uh, I don't know, hope. I don't know if we should. Yeah, thank you, Corey. So the recording will be online after we have made the transcriptions and everything. So we will let you know when it's available. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you, you. very much. Thank you. Bye bye.